All right, and we're live. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever it may be to wherever you are. My name is Nikki Acosta. This is Cloud Unfiltered. I'm joined by my awesome co-host Val. Say hi, Val. Hi. And we've got uh, we've got many dogs on today. Those of you listening won't be able to see, but uh, Diane is with us, and she's got her dog, and uh, my little Marlon wanted to be in my lap, so we're hanging out. It's a uh, a dog day here on Cloud Unfiltered. So. Let's get right to it because we don't have a lot of time and we've got a lot of awesome stuff to talk about. Uh, Diane, Michael, Michael, introduce yourselves. All right. Well, I'm Diane Euler. I'm the Director of Community Development at Red Hat and I work on the OpenShift project and lead all the cross-community collaboration efforts um, at Red Hat around the OpenShift ecosystem, which means um, I get to play with everybody in the CNCF like Kubernetes and Fluent and Jaeger and all those good folks plus all the wonderful people at Cisco and all of the um, folks who are using OpenShift um, in production and POCs around the world. So um, I think I have the best job in the world. I'm convinced you're first, uh, you yeah, know, so. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> I'm Mike White. I'm an architect here at Cisco. Uh, I work in the Global Infrastructure Services Group and for the past 18 years, I've been working on various platforms as a service. Uh, the last uh, few years, we've been working with Red Hat on the OpenShift uh, platform. And uh, we're currently using OpenShift version 3 as our next uh, generation container and platform as a service offering. And I'm the other Mike. Uh, they often refer to us as Mike Squared here at Cisco. Uh, I'm, I guess, was is the lead design engineer around our container efforts here at Cisco IT. Uh, been working with Mike White for probably the past two plus years now on uh, particularly the OpenShift 3 deployment uh, that we affectionately call the CAE or uh, Cloud Application Environment, uh, which is both a kind of a containers as a service solution as well as a traditional kind of web app uh, PaaS like solution as well. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invite, Nikki. You're welcome. And, and I think the whole reason we got together today was was because of this talk that y'all recently delivered together with uh, Diana, the fine folks at Red Hat. Uh, so first, give us some some background about what, you know, tell us how you got to Red Hat uh, to begin with as far as using it for your uh, PaaS choice uh, platform. And then uh, let us know about this talk that you delivered. What was it about? Well, I'm going to interject just, just for a second. These guys um, are very modest. Um, they've been, I think they've even done a, a, a migration from OpenShift V2 to v, V3. They, they've been around the OpenShift world for quite some time. So um, I, I love working with these guys, and they totally rocked it um, on the stage in Boston at um, the day before Red Hat Summit. We did an OpenShift Commons gathering. So we had about 300 people in the room, and um, they just did a, a wonderful. Uh, well, Mike Squared, the twin, however you want to call them, um, <laughs> presentation on on their journey and why you know why multi tenancy and all these you know was just wonderful. So um, I'm really pleased to be back here with um, what I call the twins. Um, so uh, with that, um, I, they they've got some deep history and deep knowledge about OpenShift and and lots of things. So I'm I'm ready for them to share it again with everybody. Damn, I should have let Diane introduce you guys. <laughs> Seriously, that was, yeah, that was nice. Yeah, can, can you write my like resume or something? You know, that was that was impressive. Your CV. Yeah. Wow. If you'll submit it to it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're unfiltered here, folks, for yeah, a reason. Seriously. <laughs> Why don't I All right. kind of a, a two minute background on on how we got to OpenShift and then we can uh, jump in and talk about our uh, our topic in May at OpenShift Commons. So we've been doing platform as a service for many years here at Cisco, probably before platform as a service was even coined as a term, we were offering multi-tenant environments for hosting web applications. Um, about five years ago, maybe six, uh, we started working with Red Hat and the OpenShift product because we wanted to expand from just offering a limited number of technologies on our platform to being able to offer all of the um, open source technologies that were becoming popular at the time. Hey, and Mike, just to be clear, these were internal Cisco people or this was to Cisco customers or were these internal Cisco projects that were running on this? 
on these platforms you've created? Our, our clients are Cisco developers. Okay. And they are developing applications that support both internal processes and uh, customer processes. So uh, our ordering and renewals is one of our biggest applications that runs on our platforms. And so that's, you know, Cisco's bread and butter, taking so, orders over the web from partners. Are you, are you allowed to say how many applications are, are, are under, under your purview? Sure, we've got northward of uh, 1,500 applications running on our platforms. Wow. And all of the life cycles of those applications run on our platforms as well. So if you take that 1,500 number and multiply it times dev and stage and yeah. load test and prod, uh, we distribute it across multiple data centers. Uh, ends up being a big number of application instances that we're we're running. Probably so this is this is the internal belly of the beast of how Cisco's internal IT stuff is running. Then, yeah, if you hit many of our websites, they're they're running off of this this platform. Awesome. Which means if I ever have a problem, I just hit folks like you up in Jabber yep, yep. to get expedited service. Mike knows about that. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> so we started, like I was saying, we started about five years ago bringing in OpenShift version. I don't even know if it was version one yet mm -hmm. at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, it, was five years ago. it must have been one, and, and that was courageous of you. <laughs> and, and once we rolled that out, we were offer, able to offer a lot of the um, open source languages to our developers as well. They could develop in PHP or Python or Ruby, whatever the, the choice may be. So one, one co common complaint I hear uh, from, from developers is that, you know, a lot of times when IT is putting cloud mm. services together for use internally, uh, that it is not sort of as easy as they would like it to be, or you know, they, they still run into these uh, sort of uh, having to jump through hoops to get through all the teams to be able to deploy an app. Yeah. What were the what did you find that at Cisco? I mean, obviously, <laughs> there's probably a lot more than just uh, this is unfiltered, right? <laughs> yeah, what? it is unfiltered. <laughs> so um, let me grab that one too. Uh, when we delivered OpenShift the first time around, five years ago, we made a big effort in uh, providing a front-end interface where developers could uh, come to a UI, order those services, and get them in less than a minute. So that's always been a, a big uh, focus of, of ours, is to make these platforms consumable by the developers. Um, there are different platforms within Cisco IT that might not be as fast, but we've always uh, wanted to do that. And with a product like uh, OpenShift that exposes its APIs, you can do a lot of integration and automation uh, that, that fa facilitates the experience. With our latest platform uh, that we've just released based on OpenShift version three, we're directly exposing the APIs of the platform to the developers. So they have un precedented within Cisco IT access to control uh, their infrastructure. And just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that, that's not just OpenShift APIs, but OpenShift also avails the Kubernetes APIs as well. We expose those. In addition to that, there was a great deal of effort to write um, API wrappers around a lot of our devices that weren't natively uh, accessible or programmatic uh, to program against. And so we created what we affectionately called CAPI or the Cloud API layer um, that was either kind of a transparent pass through for some of these APIs to be exposed or writing an entire kind of an API abstraction layer to allow our developers to provision uh, what they need when they need it. And, and frankly, you know, this is a big part of kind of the cultural shift that's occurring within the industry uh, as we see the, the rise of uh, true clouds, AWS, Azure, uh, Google, and and really for the first time in IT's history, we're facing competition. Um, traditionally, traditional IT in the past, we've had a monopoly uh, of, over our customers. Uh, we're like uh, Ma Bell back in the day. And uh, what's happened is with AWS, with Azure, all these other big cloud providers, they're not just providing hosting services, they're really providing IT as a service uh, to some extent. And so, what we realized in kind of the midst of this kind of two-year journey with OpenShift 3 in particular, where we really start seeing 
this kind of really kick off within Cisco is that we needed to get faster. We needed to enable our developers. We had to make them successful, frankly, in order to keep them as customers. Um, and um, so, you know, to recapture some of those workloads. Now, that's not to say that it, we view AWS as a competitor or Azure or any of those other big clouds, uh, but we see it as a, you know, both are needed and required in this new world, and we need to do a better job of catching up and our agility and our feature sets. Um, and so that's been a big challenge for us and, and a big part of why we've been driving the way we have. So, so why'd you go with open, open uh, shift? Like what was the, the reason for going there? And Mind if I take that one too, or? If you know the answer, go for it. Yeah, so about two <laughs> years ago, uh, we started kind of down this container POC process. Uh, we knew OpenShift 2 was probably gonna be heading close to end of life, and so we needed a PaaS replacement. Um, but in addition to that, there was also a parallel effort going uh, within the infrastructure side of IT. So Mike's from PaaS, I'm more from traditional infra, uh, around containerization as um, kind of a first class citizen equivalent to the way we treat hypervisors today in the data center. And so, or what we kind of refer to now as container as a service. Um, and so it was really two different mindsets of what we were hoping to get out of a product, uh, out of containerization within IT. But as we were kind of going down this path, um, Separately, we kind of start merging together and looking at it together and realizing that uh, there's an opportunity here to, to grow paths beyond just paths and to grow uh, infrastructure beyond just infrastructure. And, um, I and that's kind quote, of what's our The quote that you uh, told me, Mike, was that IT got caught with its pants down, is the quote <laughs> that you used when I talked to you originally. And I was like, oh, that's a good way to put it. And I think, you know, you're probably not alone in that. I think IT departments everywhere are kind of feeling that to some extent. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think we've been fortunate enough that we're catching it maybe a little bit earlier than a lot of bigger businesses are. Um, they're going to be facing this too. They are facing this too. Uh, I think just by the nature of the size of a company, a smaller uh, business is able to be a bit more agile. A younger business probably has picked this up right from the get-go. So it's a it's a unique factor with large enterprise IT services like ourselves. And I mean, Cisco isn't very old, uh, 30 some odd years now, but uh, it's it's kind of the granddaddy in the Silicon Valley. So uh, we, we have a lot of legacy. We have a lot of things that we need to continue to support and maintain, uh, but we also have a kind of a precedence to run the cutting edge, latest, greatest technology trends. Um, and so it puts us in a unique situation where we need to be able to do both. Uh, so yeah, we did kind of get caught with our pants down uh, by, by the cloud evolution, a revolution. Um, yeah, absolutely agree with that. Five years ago, I, I mean, you, you probably caught it, I think, arguably before most people. What is on, what's the cloud or infrastructure that you're targeting underneath your OpenShift deployment? And your containers, where are you throwing containers? What's under the hood? Uh, so both, uh, hybrid, so both VM and bare metal. And a uh, longer term goal for us is bare metal. We see a lot of advantages with that, um, mostly around um, you know, infrastructure um, capacity uh, utilization improvements, uh, not taking on a hypervisor tax. Um, and so hyper, you know, hypervisors, VMs are very much needed, are important. Um, and I believe a lot of people will be running containers on top of VMs until, well, forever. Um, and that's totally fine. It just really depends on your use case. Uh, for us, we're aiming at not just providing um, traditional microservice or web applications off our platform, but also more stateful clustered systems like databases. And those have some typically some very stringent performance requirements in regards to latency in particular uh, that we're just not able to do on virtual machines. and um, those databases are running on bare metals today and they will never end up on VMs. And so the ability to take that and put those into containers um, without causing any sort of performance uh, loss and then utilizing the spare capacity that exists on those machines for thinner applications like web apps, uh, again, improves our infrastructure efficiency quite a bit. Um, now, overall, I think everyone would agree containerization and microservice architecture mindset is really aimed at the developer and there's a tons and tons of advantages to developers in, in this kind of a setup. But really, you know, from an infrastructure point of view, uh, there's a lot of advantages as well. And a big part of us trying to get this moving forward was to, to preach both 
uh, to both sides of the house and to realize that there's a lot of wins here for everyone. So what does the, the application path look like for some of these people? Are you taking old apps and migrating those or, or is, has this traditionally been used for newer cloud native type apps or is it a mix? I'll let you take yeah. that one. All of the above. Yeah, that, that's what I'm uh, saying. One of the things also is that, I mean, lots of people are lifting and shifting, um, but the nice thing about OpenShift that it is it allows you to do both stateful and stateless apps. Um, you're not limited to 12 factor apps in any way. So um, the wrappers that these guys are written for their, AP, their legacy APIs really are some of the helpful tools that push that forward. So that's yeah, so with that as the foundation, um, we're able to do uh, both greenfield development um, and migration work. So uh, typically the, the path we follow when we roll out a new platform is to get it stood up and tested out and then we will engage with some of our more forward thinking development teams who are really trying to, to push the envelope and that's where we test the new features. So we have a lot of teams who are actually interested in all the buzz around containers and Kubernetes and, and OpenShift, and they want to break up their monolithic applications into microservices. So we've got a handful of those folks who are either developing brand new applications or re-architecting legacy applications. We invite them onto the platform first to kind of put it through its paces. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we will migrate a lot of the legacy applications from the old platform uh, onto the new. So at this point in time, we're developing a lot of scripting to uh, pick up and move an OpenShift 2 application, uh, containerize it, and put it on, on 3. Super rad. So, so Mike, uh, going back to the culture thing, and someone's got a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure who it is. It might be us. Uh, the mic is in front of the speaker, so I apologize about that. Oh, that's I'll right. Back in reposition here. Okay, but we can try that. How's that? So far, so good. Oh, much better. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so, so Mike, you and I again have talked a lot about kind of the cultural shift. Uh, as you kind of look across, you know, all of these teams, being a traditional infrastructure guy. Are you finding that the the cultural change is is going pretty smooth? Is it rocky? Like, what are the types of, of things that people are running into as they move from traditional infrastructure up to cloud to using platform as a service? I think we could probably both tackle that. So, <laughs> um, I, I think, yeah, of course, there's there, it's rocky. It's challenging. Um, in fact, a lot of the questions that we were getting after our presentation at Summit in particular were mostly around culture questions of, of how, how to drive this change, how were you guys able to make this happen, um, how much resistance a lot of these folks were hitting and trying to, to change the way that IT perceives and functions. Um, on one side, you know, I think from the developer point of view, it's, it's easy. The developer culture fits right in line with this. and um, Someone asked me once, like, how are you driving getting adoption? And it's like, well, we're, we're not really having to do much to drive adoption. They're coming to us at this point. Uh, they, they want it. They need it. Again, it's most of the advantages have been towards, you know, uh, developer teams. Uh, from an infrastructure side, there's, I think this has always been the case, there's always kind of a fear of new things, uh, which is kind of ironic considering that we're a technology-focused organization where there's constant change. But especially in, in recent years, as uh, our technology has become a lot more advanced and complex, uh, in some ways, it's also reduced a lot of complexity and simplified others. And so um, if you take a look, say, 10 years ago, before VMs really took over, uh, the amount of servers a system administrator could administrate um, was maybe in the tens to low you know, hundreds. Uh, post the VM revolution that's occurred, that's now uh, always well above the hundreds of servers that a single uh, server administrator could manage and handle. Um, and so as new technologies come down the pipeline, I think people are, one, are kind of afraid of what that might mean for their own role and job. But as a culture, especially larger enterprises, 
there's kind of an overwhelming cultural sense of needing to keep things up and running and keep the status quo, keep things humming. And um, anytime a new technology comes down the pipeline that's sufficiently disruptive to that flow, it can cause bumps. And so the key, I think, is really just persistence <laughs> and communication and persistence and persistence. And eventually, uh, I think if you're persistent enough and you're you know, just transparent enough and you uh, present the facts well enough, uh, either your arguments will win them over or uh, the rest of the industry will get caught up and help you finish out the, the discussion, the argument. Um, and you know, we have certainly have still have a long way to go. I think we're kind of in the midst of a, a big cultural shift in the way we do IT. A lot of it has been kind of driven by the work that we've done around containerization, and it's kind of rippling out to the rest of our organization. Um, but we still have a long ways to go, and uh, we still we're still being persistent, and we're still communicating, and we're still being persistent. So, um, yeah, I'll I'll add a different uh, perspective to that that question. So as far as the culture change goes, I think what we see is the, the developers are coming to us and definitely clamoring for the new features. Um, but as we all know with cloud, when you, you give more responsibility to the, you know, more control to the developers, that also comes with a lot of responsibility. So in traditional IT infrastructures, we always built things mm -hmm to provide availability, to provide resilience, to provide uptime uh, for the developers. Uh, now when we move to a cloud model, uh, while Kubernetes and OpenShift will do their best to keep an application up, you know, you've got those APIs where you can uh, dynamically scale your application. You can uh, redeploy it easily since it's in containers to another location if, uh, if a data center goes down for some reason. So, I think that's one of the the cultural yeah. shifts we're we're seeing. Where um, yes, you can have all this flexibility, all this agility, uh, but with that comes, comes a little bit more responsibility on your side to take care of. Uh, yeah, where, where you, I'm going to ask a question too. Is like one of the things that the CI/CD workflow um, and how developers are now part and parcel of that. And, and I'm, I don't recall exactly what you're doing um, at um, Cisco around that, but that also has changed. You know, before we just threw our apps over the fence and mm -hmm. IT um, tested it on their machines. And so that whole workflow of CI, CD, and whether you're using Jenkins or you know, whatever your workflow mm -hmm. is, that has changed. Um, that, that's been a cultural shift in and of itself. Um, Completely for, agree. For a lot of, uh, and not just for developers, for IT as well, right? And so uh, there's been a lot of thought and, and work into integrating CI, CD pipelines, not just for code, but also for documentation, for infrastructure itself. Um, the CI, CD mindset and, and mechanisms allow for transformation across all the different ways in which we work. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages to it. It's just a bit of a hurdle to get non-developers into that kind of a mindset because it is a bit of a shift. I want to kind of add a little bit to what Mike was saying, though, too, and kind of as he's talking about this cloud methodology mindset and this responsibility shift really out of infrastructure more onto the developer teams to maintain their application uptime. Um, in addition to that, that also really changes not just our culture, but the way we have to build out and design our data centers as well. And uh, that is also a challenge. And uh, unlike software, and I would argue even servers, those things are fairly relatively easy to upgrade or change. Data center design and infrastructure, that's physical, you know, actual hard hats construction type stuff, uh, that's harder to change. And, and so, you know, we've been having to do a lot of work in that space um, as well and trying to adapt to this kind of new cloud or horizontal scale model in the way that we uh, try to avail uptime through spare capacity requirements uh, versus you know, load balancers and uh, active passive setups and all these other types of things. Um, and so with that, you know, we've had to, I was explaining to another customer of ours earlier, um, if you look at our data centers, it's almost like we have, you ever seen those really ugly yards uh, where it's just like dark brown, like dead grass, but it's like still a little green. Oh, and like you've mine? Seen like one spot <laughs> where like they cut a little, the same thing. What grass. 
Well, that's what our data centers kind of look like right now. And so we have, you know, a lot of legacy, uh, you know, brown field, brown grass uh, design, a data center for vertical stacks, HA stacks. And we're kind of sprinkling in our horizontal new design within these existing data centers to make it work. And so uh, one of the advantages at, at Cisco, and this is unfiltered, uh, we have the most patchy grass of, of any corporation I know. Uh, we got a lot of brown grass, and we got little spots of green grass everywhere. <laughs> the Node.js um, containers, the weeds, um, or the Go, the, the new, you know, what, which um, languages you consider the weeds that are out in my yard? So, <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of brown legacy patches and, and a lot of weeds going on. There you so. go. <laughs> so in this, in this new sort of uh, paradigm, in this new culture shift, what happens to traditional network teams, traditional security teams? You know, all these other teams that have kind of played a part in the mowing of the traditional infrastructure, like what happens to those roles? Are you still interfacing with them in cloud or have you turned a lot of that responsibility over in the form of, you know, quotas or limitations for cloud users? Let me take that yeah. first. Um, those folks are still critically important to our success as a platform. Um, when we talk about changing to a cloud native mindset, you can't just do it with one piece of the infrastructure. Yeah. It doesn't work. You have to provide that experience to all of the infrastructure services. So Mike mentioned earlier the, the cloud API or CAPI. That's been our uh, attempt to bring some of those services forward and make them programmable by the clients, um, you know, even if they don't have a traditional multi-tenant API. So um, we've spent a lot of time working with the storage team, the compute team, the networking guys to, um, if they don't have programmable interfaces to their services now, let us front them. Um, and so it, we wouldn't have been successful without those, Absolutely. those folks. And you know, I, and I guess to add on to that, especially security, I only see that need growing. Um, in the container world, you know, it, again, since we're shifting things up to the cloud, workloads might not even be existing on traditional, your internal infrastructure. It could be sitting in AWS, it could be sitting in Google, uh, Azure. I um, feel like I gotta mention all three every time I bring up one, to be fair. Uh, but, um, you know, and so, because of that, I think security actually gets even harder in some ways because it's abstracted away. Traditionally, in IT, uh, IT infra has been the uh, the henchman for for our infosec security folks, information information security folks, because that's where the infrastructure is where the rubber hit the road. Um, now, with that responsibility, back to what Mike was saying, from infrastructure up to the application, now security is really having to engage with each of these individual application owners to ensure security. Um, and that presents a lot of that a lot of challenges. Cloud also introduces a lot of abstraction and vision obscurance um, to what's happening underneath. Um, the more easy you make it for one group, the harder and more complex you make it for another. And so, one of the things that we've been really trying to focus on within CAE is making ways of allowing our infosec guys, our networking guys, to get better access and understanding of what's going on in the environment, so that they can grab that data. But that's only one piece of the puzzle for them. Uh, they're also having to consider public cloud and how are they going to grab that information that they need to make sure that things aren't compromised at the application layer. And so things like app dynamics, not to plug Cisco tech, but well, actually to plug Cisco tech, right? Why not? Um, you know, or other, you know, you know, log sash or any other, you know, logging tool or monitoring tool or metrics tool and to, to look for vulnerabilities and, and, and things like that. From a networking side, you know, I would argue similarly. Um, containers present a lot more challenges. Uh, we're looking at expansive growth uh, in the networking space, so much so that IPv4 addresses were nearly out. We can't give each of our container instances a native IP4 address. It's just, there's no way. We have too many of them. And so if you think that's a problem just with IP allotment, think about all the different uh, contracts and policies and all those things that have to occur between all these individual microservices or databases and web servers and all that, which has previously existed at the traditional layer and has required many man hours to maintain and keep up. 
now we're multiplying the amount of components greatly and the, the amount of interlinking that's occurring on the network greatly um, that creates a lot more work that is required. And so that's where things like ACI or and titration kind of come in from our point of view as to kind of help wrap fix that or to address that, to manage that scale. Um, and so that's a big challenge, I think, going down forward, uh, not to mention um, the fact that most of our environments are not flat. So we're running VXLAN encapsulation overlay networks on top of our underlays. Um, and so there's, yeah, plenty of work and we greatly appreciate our network and security folks and our compute folks um, because, yeah, it wouldn't be possible without all of them and they're still going to be very much needed. It's just the work that they're going to be tackling is going to be uh, just different and I think more exciting and challenging personally. Fun time to be there's, in IT. Go ahead, Diane. Well, there, there's just so much going on in uh, the security and the monitoring and the metering space um, right now. I mean, I do that another um, podcast, the OpenShift Commons briefings, and I'd say about at least a third of them are some variation on security or monitoring or metering. And um, yeah. the one we just did one a couple of days ago, or well, we've done two this month, and both people have hit on um, a really great resource that. Um, the Center for Internet Security has uh, Kubernetes benchmarking, and they met a, a phenomenal job they did getting um, the 3.7 Kubernetes release benchmarks up and out. And two, I've now found two different groups. Um, New Vector is a company that's automated those benchmark tests, mm -hmm. and then there's an open source pro project called Kube-Bench. And it, there's and, and that's just one little piece yeah. of, the, you know, of the puzzle. And, you know, and then I, I just did another one with someone who was another group that was uh, doing all the networking visibility, checking and logging all yeah. this. So for me, the interesting thing is a long time ago, I came out of um, an IT auditing software background. So as we go to microservices and there's bazillions more in the log files, and someone now we're all talking serviceless so yeah. you know, serverless and we're going to like functions as a service yeah. that the nightmare of um, being compliant you know if you're a HIPAA compliant or yeah. enterprise yeah. or you're Cisco and you have encryption and you're taking you know credit cards and all this the, the things that people have to worry about are still all there yeah. you know and it's how do we surface those up in ways where there's visualization and audit logging and tracking and things to, to you know, that humans can deal with and yeah. like verify, you know, yeah. check off their compliances. So uh, the security and compliance officers at Cisco are really busy right now, I would bet. And all of that, that didn't go away. Nope. So, and, and the roles, the traditional roles that people played in IT have just morphed into cloud native roles. Yeah. Um, and uh, our job is, is from the technology side is to make sure that they have the tools to to do their jobs too, you know, because some of that stuff is pretty intricate and low level details that we now, and, and we're generating a lot more data. Uh, and I think that's really been um, pretty, awesome, pretty awesome. phenomenal. <laughs> do, do you think that the the complexity is is reduced or lessened when a, an enterprise or a, you know a large user decides to leverage open source technologies? Like I was reading as yesterday, there was an article that they have successfully given a DNA sequencer a virus, like an actual virus, and they they wanted to do this because they wanted to show that there was a a flaw in some open source software and of course there's you know there's been some uh some so it, flaws in bitcoin so open, and everything else yeah well open it's i think that the, you're framing the question a little awkwardly i think that it's not um what, what we're talking about is the migration to cloud native and open source has been around since pearl and you know the early days and like when i started like because i'm ancient and um and, you know it's like oh it, open source is pretty much the bread and butter now of any enterprise, any project you work on is gonna have open source components and there's great tools for scanning the software and finding that bugs and the fact that people and they're coming in the DNA thing, um, that's not open source's problem, that's a coding problem and something else. I, I would argue that there's probably a benefit just because you have so many more eyes on these open source projects versus absolutely. you know a proprietary thing, right? Yeah, that's yeah. been the that's been kind of the traditional response, right? And so, uh, I think the reason why we hear a lot more about open source uh, 
issues and, and hacks and whatnot is mostly because there are so many eyes on it and it does actually get fixed. Uh, whereas proprietary software, you might not necessarily have as many eyes on it. But I mean, there's ultimately is one going to be ultimately better than the other in regards to security? I, I think that's too almost too broad of a question to answer. It's going to really depend on a product by product basis, right? Just as you have really crappy proprietary software, uh, you have really crappy open source projects. Um, yeah. And oh, which open, open and, source and the stuff that Diane works is not one of those. Just no, 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 no. <laughs> and, but you know, like we, we've all we've all seen something, some interesting idea on GitHub. We downloaded it and then regretted it. Um, and <coughs> and so you know, the, it the the quality. It's hard to you know declare one or the other better in that sense because there's examples of both and both. Um, I would argue though that it is a little bit harder for enterprises to adopt open source traditionally. Um, and again, this is more of a culture mind shift change, is because open source methodology, which I think is um, its greatest strength in regards to it, you know, it's all modular componentized, and you have to tie all those pieces together to build a solution, right? And you even see that kind of a model and that mindset in Linux itself, right? In the shell, you have to pipe a series of commands to get a certain output just the way you want. Kubernetes is very similar in that way. All, all open source projects are like that, at least I think, in my opinion, good ones. The problem, though, is that traditional corporate IT uh, are still kind of stuck in some of the old days where they got a single executable, they double clicked, and it was up and running and good to go. Now, to Red Hat's well, credit, I think they've tried to bridge that gap a bit there. Um, but you know, there's there's just inherently more challenges, I think, with the more complex the system, but also the more powerful it is. So it's a trade off. I, I hear a lot from customers that there's a, a risk aversion factor too. Like, you know, the reason why somebody would choose to get, let's say, a, an OpenStack private cloud from us is because if something goes wrong, they have someone to blame. You know, they've they've got uh, the choke to throw yeah. or throat to choke. <laughs> yeah. I also think there's there's one plug that I, I'm going to say that is a, a bit of a um, thing that I'm, I've been trying to say whenever I get the opportunity and people talking about open source, is GitHub is a huge and wonderful thing. But if I could just plug one thing, that everybody who has a, a, a GitHub repo would put a license in their readme, you know, um, and add that into um, their repos because there are so many people who equate this is out there in GitHub to an open source project and so many people today put stuff up in GitHub that we want to use, but they didn't put an Apache 2 license in there. And those are the kind of poison pill things that like, oh, you're, you know, you're halfway through your thing and then legal does a review of your, you know, all of your source code or you do some source code um, analysis on it. And then you find this one library and I'm not going to blame Python, but I'm going to use Python for example, that you know, didn't they didn't put that in, and then you have to go all the way back to square one and clean up everything, and and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of automation. Black Duck does stuff. Tons of people do great things around automation, so that shouldn't be happening. And we do a lot of we make sure that doesn't happen with OpenShift and with all of the things that we we release into OpenShift. Um, and I'm sure Cisco does similar things. But the one thing it's sort of like the general surgeon's warning that I would ask every developer who's out there who has a GitHub account is. If you're putting code out there for people to reuse and you want them to, go out and throw an Apache 2 license. Um, you just cut and paste and pull it in and you know you make Diane happy and um, you make the rest of us be able to use your code. Um, so there are outstop, that's my podium for the day. <laughs> that was great, Diane, thank you for that. I wouldn't want to piss you off, I'm just saying it. And you're, you're like one of my idols, so. <laughs> And I still I, want I, to push you off. I do remember getting pinged by somebody, some company, just saying, "Hey, can we use your library?" And I said, "Sure." And they go, well, "What's the license?" I go, "I don't know, whatever." And they said, "Well, you got to put a license in it so we can use it." So, um, and you get pinged by just random companies sometimes. Yeah, so that's yeah, there's, there's tons of great, thing, great tools out there to check it. So you know, as an enterprise, you know, you, you know, reach out to us. We'll, we'll definitely we have lots of people um, who can help with that. But it's it starts at the beginning. It's like you write a piece of code, you throw it in GitHub, and you think it's you know open source. It's not. You know, it's it's open. It's out there, but you can't let other people just can't use it, especially in an enterprise situations. And I think that's the only risk that I see that's coming up um, from open source because what was the Sunlight Foundation? You know, you put something out in the open, enough eyeballs on it, enough sunlight, it'll get um, cleansed. So um, 
we'll, we'll fix most of that problem. Are there some licenses that like, it's not not to change the subject on uh, go this license directly just just real quick? Uh, <laughs> there's like the unlicensed. There's the do whatever the f you want license. Uh, any gotchas with these licenses? Um, well, I think we should have another whole session on licenses. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's like the MIT license and no. so I have some friends and who who will love to have that conversation. And <laughs> every time I venture out there, I you know someone will come back and slam me. Oh, my like, GPL is the best, you know, or GNU, yeah. whatever. Okay. And I'm. I like it. So Diana, I just have to say, if you ever decide to go into a new career, you should seriously think about becoming a PSA announcer. I was thinking like those 1980s cartoons, you know, I watched G.I. Joe's as a kid, and it's like, and the more you know, you know, just uh, you could be that voice. <laughs> I, can, I can be Smokey the Bear, you know. There you go, exactly. Um, but yeah, that's my one thing. It, it is my pet peeve in the universe is people who put up repos that don't have licenses or you know, acknowledge the fact that they need one in some way. But anyways, and you can always ask me because I will come and help you. But the, I, I think by the time it gets into something like Cisco, and this is kind of to bring it back around to back to the very beginning when you were V2 and you were asking, um, people were asking you for other open source projects to use. Um, have you seen a growth or um, a cornucopia of different languages and different tools being used at Cisco? or? Did the opposite happen? Did everybody go to Java? You know. Well, everybody was originally on Java. What happened? Um, I think the yeah. the adoption of other technologies across the board has been a touch on the slower side than I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, some of these you know forward looking teams who are now you know picking the right technology to fit their requirements are definitely branching out into the. Um, open source technologies. Our first big adopter on CAE and OpenShift 3 has picked so many technologies that I had never even heard of before. And I think that's kind of the, the beauty of open source and the open community. They've been able to uh, go out, find the technologies that they need and run them on OpenShift. Um, and they didn't have to have my approval or my blessing. I didn't have to spend three months learning the technology. And so long as it passes a vulnerability scan, um, they're free to use it. So, uh, you know, I think that's uh, pretty powerful. That is powerful. And that's a benefit I didn't even think of. But I guess on, on your end, that's the, the stuff that will either take you months to do or literally minutes or seconds to decide, right? Yeah. So just the time factor involved. So we're we're getting close on, on time. I know you have a hard stop, Diane. So I, I wanted to first thank all three of you uh, for joining Val and I. Uh, this has been a crazy, insightful podcast episode. Uh, I know, Diane, there are some places uh, and some things that you wanted to, to give a shout out for. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, um, and um, hopefully the Cisco uh, Michael twins will uh, will join us there too. We're going to host another OpenShift Commons gathering the day before KubeCon in Austin on December 5th. Um, and you can find out about that at commons.openshift.org. All the information's there. So we'd love to have you guys there again. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to what's going to make your lives even more interesting is all the service catalog work that's going on. Um, for Kubernetes that's going to bring even more interesting variations on things that are available yeah. Um, uh, yeah. into your world. So get ready for that. Um, and around three, release um, 1.7 of Kubernetes came before, and I think the alpha version of Kubernetes Catalog, which I consider the best part of Cloud Foundry. Um, and they've open sourced it, so kudos to them um, for working um, with the rest of the community and doing all that cross-community collaboration. But really, there's some amazing things coming, um, our back and others, in, in the new releases of Kubernetes. And we'll be talking about all of that um, uh, as the gathering is where all the upstream project leads come together to give updates to the OpenShift community. Um, um, and basically, it's a great prep, ses prep session if you're going into KubeCon. So um, if you go there, you'll get all the like tips and tricks on which talks to talk to go to for the next couple of days, too. So it's really lots of fun. And we have good espresso and good beer. <laughs> and, and I'll do a little add on to that. Uh, if y'all find yourselves in town, I'm wearing my uh, Franklin barbecue shirt today. 
Uh, if you find yourselves in Austin and you uh, you know how many folks are coming, Michael, Michael, Diane, <laughs> let me know and I will call in advance and get some Franklin barbecue ordered. If you eat meat, if not, I don't know, have some potato salad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Franklin. So last words from, uh, thank you, Diane. Last words from Michael and Michael, uh, you know, a lot of people have CIO mandates. They're saying, hey, you know, get everyone using cloud, become a service provider, stop being a cost center, start providing, you know, value to the business, help us help you, but, you know, go help yourselves first. What advice would you give to these companies that have these mandates and need to go down this path? I mean, obviously, you know, I would say it's fair to recommend that having something like OpenShift uh, is, a, is a huge benefit. What other advice would you give to these companies making that transition? I'd say just go for it and always keep your developers in mind, right? This is cool technology. It's got a lot of benefits for the infrastructure as well, but it's the transition to cloud native is more a, a change in behavior and process uh, than technology. The technology certainly enables it. Uh, it's good to have good partners like Red Hat, um, but you've got to just get it out there and, and make the experience great for your developers. Mike, other Mike. I have nothing to add to that. That was that was spot on. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So if we want to find you all on the uh, on the social channels, I know Diane, you are still at Python DJ. Uh, yep, and at um, OpenShift Common as well. So if you're looking for us um, and you want more information about it, just look for OpenShift Common, um, and we'll we'll get you hooked up. And props to Red Hat. I recently got, as part of their open source community, a little viewfinder in the mail. Did y'all see that? Too. They're so I, awesome. Aren't they awesome? They're I opened so the box. Cool. I was like, what is this? And I opened the box, and it was like the old school red like viewfinder. Like <laughs> He's going to go grab his while I do it. I, I seriously do I think that's been my success, most successful tweet this year was like, hey, whoever thought of this is a genius. Like, it was so neat to get uh, an actual physical thing that was like nostalgic in the mail from Red Hat, which is awesome. He's going to get Microsoft it. Microsoft Red Hat. There, he's yeah. got it. there it is. This yeah. is the coolest thing ever. Thank you. <laughs> Best marketing gimmick gift thing ever. So cool. Why don't they all do that, right? And, and where can we find uh, Mike and Mike on the social channels? Uh, I, I've been a I have a Twitter account. It's not even worth bothering looking at. Uh, but yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. Just Mike Doherty, Cisco. You'll find me without any problems. Same for and me. That's, I'm kind that's, of a social media neophyte. So so okay. So leave them alone, guys. If you want to get a hold of them, guys and gals, hit me up. I'll put you in touch. How's that? <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you again for joining us. And with that. Our show is over. Subscribe, leave a comment, uh, tune in next week. Uh, we've got plenty more guests lined up all the way to the end of the year. So uh, with that, everybody say bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys.